Towards the close of 1949, the lights burn bright. After a decade of darkness, the glow of her cities symbolized Europe's slow but steady recovery. The lights shone for a new Europe, but did they shine for real peace? In Nissen huts, built for war against Hitler, crews were briefed for extensive air maneuvers. Okay, remember the Met report. Off to go, chaps. Once again, the bombers beat their way through the skies of Western Europe. Below, on the plains of Germany, where the pincers practiced for the Blitzkrieg, once again, men and tanks played at war. At close range, field commanders and war ministers watched the armies of the West engage in the biggest mock battles yet attempted. But though ready for war, men hoped that war would never come again. In Holland, before Arnhem's white crosses, fresh flowers were laid. It seemed that as such blossoms fade, so fade the ideals born of sacrifice. Yet far from Europe's battlefields, amid the skyscrapers of New York, those ideals were given new life. There, in the shadow of a new building, President Truman said, We have come together today to lay the cornerstone of the permanent headquarters of the United Nations. These are the most important buildings in the world, for they are the center of man's hope for peace and a better life. This is the place where the nations of the world will work together to make that hope a reality. A new building was dedicated, an old cause rededicated. For only when fresh flowers are laid are great resolves remembered. Nowhere did the lights burn brighter than in the great cities of the United States. But though they lived in the world's richest country, most Americans realized that the future of all depended upon the recovery of less fortunate Europe, that Europe to which they were so strongly tied by bonds of race and culture. So far from the lights of the West, Europe's struggle for recovery was sustained with the help of martial aid. In Paris, the statesmen gathered for economic discussions to report on the progress of the European recovery program. Addressing the meeting, America's Paul Hoffman said, The people and the Congress of the United States, and I am sure a great majority of the people of Europe, have instinctively felt that economic integration is essential if there is to be an end of Europe's recurring <coughs> economic crises. After reminding delegates that martial aid would end in 1952, he continued, I do make this considered request that you have ready, early in 1950, a record of accomplishment and a program which together will take Europe well along the road toward economic integration. Essential to the progressive recovery of Europe was the speedy recovery of Britain. Although in her blitzed cities the scars of war were fast disappearing, nevertheless the nation still faced enormous tasks ahead. The rehousing of millions in her overcrowded towns, the building of new hospitals, schools and civic centers. Equally essential were the reorganization and expansion of industry, new factories in once distressed areas, power stations, huge steelworks to outproduce the best in Europe. Rising in the lonely glens of Scotland were dams, generating stations and pipelines, a vast new hydroelectric scheme to power all Scotland, 
to feed new current into Britain's hard-worked grid system. But if Britain's plans were long-term, her needs were immediate. Centred mainly in her large industrial areas, her ever-growing population now totaled over 45 millions. 45 millions to be fed and provided with a decent standard of living. Though Britain's farmlands were rich and fertile, at best they could provide only a fraction of the nation's needs. And so, year in and year out, into Britain's docks poured a steady stream of imports. Wheat, sugar and meat to stock her larders. Cotton, rubber and metal to feed her busy factories. To pay for these, a high proportion of British manufactured goods went overseas. On her exports, Britain had built her reputation. On her exports, Britain fed her people. Now, to balance its economic ledger, the nation looked more than ever to its markets abroad, and particularly to those of the all-important dollar. For Britain's dollar crisis was far from over. Though the Palliund, dollar exports still could not pay for dollar imports. Although political parties differed with regard to method, all were agreed that only by increased output could this dollar gap be closed. In a broadcast to the nation, what Sir Stafford Cripps said, We've made in this country since the end of the war. We are producing at record levels and exporting half as much again as we were before the war. But, despite this, we've been quite unable to earn enough dollars. We must either earn more dollars or spend less to get a balance. I do appeal most earnestly and with all my strength to our manufacturers and exporters to redouble their efforts to sell their goods in dollar markets. 